We have some new developments to bring you right now. The University of Pennsylvania's Board of Trustees has just wrapped up an emergency meeting as school president Liz McGill faces scathing criticism over her testimony at Tuesday's congressional hearing about anti-Semitism at the Ivy League school. The presidents of Harvard and MIT are also under fire for their statements at that hearing. CNN's Matt Egan joins us now with the details. So Matt, what are you hearing about this emergency meeting with the Penn trustees? Well, here's what we know, Boris. Um, this was a virtual gathering of the school's powerful board of trustees. And while it wasn't a formal meeting, we do know it came together rather hastily. A university spokesperson telling me that this uh, virtual gathering was uh, organized around 2 p.m. yesterday. And that timing is key because that's just a few hours after the governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, condemned Penn President Liz McGill's testimony on Capitol Hill. And he actually called for the Board of Trustees to meet and decide whether or not that testimony lives up to the school's values. Now, we don't know whether or not the fate of Liz McGill uh, was the central focus of this virtual gathering, but you got to believe this was the elephant in the room. Uh, this hearing and that testimony came under enormous scrutiny. In particular, there was an exchange between Liz McGill and uh, Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. Listen to that exchange. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision. Now, those answers uh, faced intense scrutiny. We heard from billionaire Bill Ackman calling on the Penn president, as well as the presidents of Harvard and MIT, to step down. The CEO of Pfizer slammed it, calling it one of the most disgraceful moments in the history of U.S. academia. Even the White House had to weigh in, making it clear that there's no place for calls for genocide. Boris, it's clear that University of Pennsylvania faces a moment of crisis. It's not clear yet whether or not Liz McGill will help lead the university's response to this crisis. So how is she personally responding to this criticism now? Well, after the hearing, uh, the University of Pennsylvania's president, Liz McGill, she did go on uh, X and try to clean up her response. She clarified that the university does need to make some changes to their policies. Listen to what Liz McGill said on Twitter yesterday. In that moment, I was focused on our university's longstanding policies aligned with the U.S. Constitution, which say that speech alone is not punishable. I was not focused on, but I should have been, the irrefutable fact that a call for genocide of Jewish people is a call for some of the most terrible violence human beings can perpetrate. I want to be clear. A call for genocide of Jewish people is threatening, deeply so. Now, that response was not enough to silence uh, some of the university's biggest critics. Uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, the CEO of the ADL, he was uh, speaking to our colleague Kate Baldwin earlier, and he said that that Liz McGill response looked like a hostage video, and he said that he has lost confidence in her ability to lead. Charlie Dent, what's going on here? Well, look, I, many people in this country don't feel that our universities permit much ideological diversity. They, there's a rush to conformity. A lot of folks don't feel comfortable and welcome. Uh, and I thought what happened in that hearing yester yesterday was really very bad for these universities. I mean, how hard is it to condemn genocide uh, unequivocally, without qualification, you know, it wasn't about context, had somebody's been advocating for the lynching of African Americans, I suspect there would be no context discussed. They would, they would absolutely talk about condemning that forcefully, as they should. But with anti-Semitism, it seems there was a little bit of, a, of an equivocation there. Mm -hmm. And it's costing these universities money. At, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Huntsman Foundation has pulled back. Mark Rowan has pulled back. And also, and here's some context, just several blocks uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, a falafel shop owner was protested for being a Jewish Israeli. I mean, I don't know what he has to do with the conflict in Gaza, but people are standing outside his store and screaming about him. So there's a lot of sensitivity in the city of Philadelphia right now. Ashley, how do you see this? Um, and your I, response to what? Yeah, Charlie no, has to say. I mean, love you, 
congressman. But I, I just, I, I'm, I'm not for sort of comparing. If they were black, then this. Let's just stay focused very much on the offense uh, towards Jewish uh, students. I, th I think we should just stay there and hold the universities accountable for their inaction on that particular issue and not bring any other sort of racial group into the conversation. But here's the other thing. I was recently talking to the White House about this, and this is uh, obviously public knowledge, but they're hyper-focused on this. They filed seven, the Department of Education's filed seven lawsuits against these universities for discrimination. Um, the, the universities that testified yesterday are among them. So they're not letting go of this particular issue uh, as they shouldn't. So that's just sort of my reaction. I think, you know, regrettably, um, the university presidents didn't have a more, you know, fulsome, um, affirming answer that I think would uh, satisfy the students. And I think that's regrettable. And maybe that means they need to readjust go back to the drawing board on the policies and we need to give them the space to actually do that and i hope that they actually will but but you know the administration and the president said they, they're going to keep their their eye on this ball and they're being very aggressive about going after these universities for um, not protecting jewish students well so the, the the question here seems to be and athena got at this in her reporting at what point does speech right. actually amount to action right does speaking mean that you are harassing or bullying someone, right? And that's what would be against the university's code of conduct, right? They seem to come down on the side of defending free speech at the expense of, um, you know, defending free speech as opposed to saying, they, they, they were trying to argue, this is speech, this is not action. I think for a lot of kind of casual observers, we've spent a lot of time looking at college campuses where they talk a lot about microaggressions. There have been a lot of conservative, you know, groups have risen up and said conservative speakers cannot come here and talk because it amounts to harm to our community. How are these two things the same? I mean, how can they say, we don't want a conservative speaker on campus because it will harm our communities, and also it's not bullying and harassment for people on our campus to call for the genocide of Jews? I, don't, I mean, I don't understand it. No, I, and I agree with you. I don't, I don't think they clearly understand. Um, I think you're also going to have to go to the drawing board and talk about what actually constitutes speech, right? Uh, if I put a noose on your door, right. does that constitute speech? I mean, clearly so, no, right? I mean, clearly well, that's I mean, harassment. But why? But but I mean, I think that's something they're going to well, have to evaluate it, and it, determine. Well, they have to be able to determine the difference between hate speech uh, and, and and legitimate First Amendment issues. I mean, when when they're talking about genocide or lynching, that's hate yeah. speech. Uh, when they're, it's about a group. It's about a yeah, specific they're, they're group they're going of people who because have of what they look they like change. or their characteristics. Yeah. It, it, correct. But there, it's true, though. That you just pointed out, Casey. There are people who are right of center who are shouted down, and they are bullied and harassed. Uh, their views are not welcome. And these universities, you know, have to be able to be much more tolerant. I always said of this ideological diversity with, on their campus within norms, and we don't want hate speech from the left or from the right. And what, what is so hard about this to call out the hate speech, but then permit? divergent views on other issues. So Margaret, I know you are, you know, you work now in, in part of a university and this is a really fraught and difficult topic. I mean, how do you see these conversations? How do you, you know, take some of this in from the students that you interact with daily? I want to answer this in two parts. A uh, small group of my students, shortly after um, Hamas attacks on Israel, we were talking about how they were feeling and processing it. it they felt a number of things. Obviously, they were, um, uh, uh, completely against uh, killing of innocent civilians. Uh, they, um, you know, but they also were really struggling with feeling the pressure that they were supposed to make a statement, like on Instagram or TikTok or something, that they were supposed to uh, take some kind of a side that was crystal clear, and they were worried about saying the wrong thing inadvertently, being judged, their friend groups splitting, how to straddle all of these things and how to contextualize what they were feeling against centuries of history that they don't completely understand. I think university leaders, um, there is a higher expectation that they would make some kind of a statement. Yeah. But I think in some way, what those students are feeling is kind of a trickle down from watching everybody make a statement. And this expectation now in our society that there is a statement that is the right statement, that is the perfect statement, and that anything else is the wrong statement. Um, I am not speaking for either of the two universities of where I teach right now, uh, but I will say I don't believe that any of this university leadership, any of these folks are anti-Semitic. I believe they are striving to figure out how to balance interests, including the interests of academic freedom 
and I believe that they are all going to be now and going forward uh, taking a lot of instruction in crisis communications because part of the challenge when you are under fire in Congress is messaging and the, of, it's the, the whole way thing. you become a university president has yeah. not traditionally been that you're yeah. as great as Nikki Haley as uh, as pushing back attacks and answering the question the way you intended to. Um, I think that um, I think this is really complicated stuff, yeah. and obviously genocide is not okay, and universities, need, I guess, need to make that clear now. Yeah. Uh, that's not okay. Uh, but if you are a university, you, there is a difference between uh, the physical safety of your students and being able to have difficult conversations of any kind in any classroom. I think they're trying to preserve their space to do that yeah. um, and not be driven by um, uh, news events or politics of the moment, they need to be more clear in their language to avoid problems like this and to assure every student, no matter their religion or ethnic background, that they are safe on right. campus.